You're listening to Don't Waste Water. If you can't monitor in real time, how can you guarantee a treatment is working? Please someone explain that to me. Because everyone is taking process guarantees. How are you taking a process guarantee when you wait for weeks to know if the process worked? Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Waste Water podcast. If you have already met the discharge limits in 30 minutes instead of the 60 minutes that you thought you needed because incoming water had low PFAS, don't spend more energy for 30 more minutes. That's the no-brainer for us. And this is something we picked up on the pilot last year. And some days we had reached the discharge limit within the first 25 minutes and we were still treating for another an hour and just wasting energy for the customer. So it became a no-brainer why we started collecting all of this data to let's start deploying this. I'm your host Antoine Valter and in today's episode I'm delighted to welcome back Fajr Mushtaq as my guest. Ask a founder who's a founder who's impact driven. Our answer is never going to be let's do the easy thing and the fast thing. Our answer is always how can we do the right thing and still make it easy and scalable. And for me these two things go hand in hand. We do the treatment we give our customers a treatment that actually works and they can afford and there is no secondary waste, there is no burning of this wastewater, there is no releasing of PFAS into the air for future generations. It is really a category defining treatment on its own, and we also give them real time monitoring. Fadger is the CEO and co founder of Oxile. They have so much power, and with great power comes a lot of responsibility, doesn't it? And I think that was kind of missed from my perspective. We went with the safe, same old, same old. And if you have this, you know, long PFAS strategic roadmap, you're researching this for years, I would have liked to see something new and not just the the same these are two BAT just go with that let's be safe what happens to the waste what happens to the long term effects of the secondary waste yeah let's not discuss that let's just do what it's safe to do Oxide destroys short medium and long chain PFAS at the source and cleans up historical contamination to below detection limits There's this saying that you're spending dog years when you're working for a startup. It sure has positives and negatives, but it boils down to what it sounds, it sure counts for five. When I first talked to Fadger on this microphone four years ago, Oxile was a several months old spin out of ETH and while in retrospect, a lot of the building blocks were already weathered there or planned, the rubber was still to hit the ground. And as garages are crazy expensive in Zurich, it was mostly a basement story. So when, a couple of weeks ago, I pushed the door of a packed office in Schlieren with satellites growing left and right to push the walls, it struck me that the saying is probably right. It maybe was four years for me, but to them it was 20. Some words changed, micropollutants got more specifically defined to PFAS and interestingly, with Europe in mind when many builds on the new US EPA regulation. Some concepts became products like the AI machine learning monitoring tool that surveys if discharge limits of 100 nanogram per liters are achieved with 99% accuracy for groundwater, a tool that Oxile, by the way, works to extend to 2 nanograms per liter in all applications. Some lab results became successful on-site proofs of concept, the entire company branding got a major update, the lease of a new building got signed, and so many more evolutions for a soaring company that's currently raising a seed round. But one thing's unchanged, the passion, energy, and endless insights you gather when discussing with Fadger. I'm not sure words can describe it, so I'll let you experience it for yourself. Right before that, let me remind you that if you like what you hear, take this episode and share it with a colleague, a friend, your boss, or your team. Hit that subscribe button and I'll meet you on the other side. Hi, Fadger. Welcome back to the microphone. You. you were a guest in season one. A lot of things have changed in the market yeah. and in Oxile within those four years. And I'm just checking on what is still today your biggest challenge which you're addressing. When we talk to you, say, micropollutants, and I guess today it might still be micropollutants, but mm -hmm. to characterize micropollutants a bit differently and maybe mm -hmm. focus on PFAS. How wrong am I with that? You're not wrong at all. You're absolutely correct. PFAS are also micropollutants. They're a subset of them. They are mobile toxic persistent. That's the definition of micropollutant, right? But in terms of being super focused, yes. So this is our focus as a company for the last two and a half years. And this focus kind of came from the market. We listened to the market. We listened to all the inbound leads that we got from customers and 90% plus of them were PFAS related. So we listened, we talked to our customers and we felt a real urgency there. It's not a pivot, it's more of a focus because nothing we did 
from a technological perspective changed. It's still the same technology, but the focus is absolutely there to make sure we are establishing ourselves as the benchmark when it comes to you know PFAS treatment or monitoring. There's a focus shift for sure. You mentioned inbound leads for PFAS. What's their challenge? What yeah. do they ask you? The most important thing they want us to focus on is can we meet the performance metrics. If they have long, medium, short chain PFAS, if they have a very tricky matrix of water, can we help them or not? Then the questions of cost and scalability and all are always a secondary concern. But if we cannot meet their treatment criteria, where they do have a lot of short chain, then it's a no-go. That's the first hurdle we have to cross, where we have to build trust with the customers that we are the broad spectra of PFAS removal treatment on the market if they want to talk about scalability and cost, right? And we happily share all the data for the broad spectra because we're very proud of that. That's the first thing we have to explain to the customers because there's not a single customer we have met so far who only had long chain or maybe back in the day they only had to report on long chain data but now they absolutely have to measure 12 PFAS compounds many of them medium and short chain or they also have to look at sometimes 40 different PFAS compounds based on which country they are from and which legislation they have to follow and that's a very interesting challenge when we get questions like this. One of the most interesting projects we got last year was from an industrial wastewater customer and they only had C4s in there, C4 PFAS compounds, super tricky water, just a bunch of PFB in there, super high concentration. And they went everywhere. And then they came to Oxal as an inbound lead. And we're still working with them and we're going on site with them this summer, which proves that even if you only have short chain, you can just come to us and we will help you with that. Inbound leads come in different fashion, but broad spectra is a huge component of can you do broad spectra? And can you make sure that what you have treated at the end is safe to discharge? How much confidence do you have of the water quality? afterwards. We do a lot of data collection here to make sure our customers have this trust that the water that we're discharging is absolutely safe to discharge because we do full mineralization, like nothing is left. There's a lot of R&D work that goes there. There's a lot of partnership work that goes there to revalidate that for our customers so that they know if they are investing in the technology, it is there for the next 10, 15 years because it meets the regulations for the future, but they don't have to worry about any like byproduct formations. We do a lot of trust building in the market and really establishing credibility with the customer right now, which is, I think, the fun part of the process. There's a lot to unpack in that. I just want to make sure we get the definitions right. You mentioned C4 and then you said short chain. C4 is the super short chain. So that's really the shortest chain PFAS there is. I mean, the shortest would be the C3s and C2s, like a TFA molecule, for example, that is C3, right? We also have customers who want us to measure C2 sometimes, which gets very tricky. But we do measure that here in our labs. Ultra short chain is C3 and C2. So we also have customers who start with the C4, of course, who want to make sure there is no C3 and C2 because you start with the C4. So we also measure ultra short chain PFAS really precisely in our own labs here today. So that's what I mean. When we do broad spectra, we even do ultra short chain PFAS, of course. I'll come back to the lab. I'll come back to what you implement for your customers, how you do that. And also on the no byproducts and the full mineralization, which I think Mm -hmm, those are super mm -hmm. important aspects. But you said something about the broad spectrum. Yeah. And I guess that is the number one reason people would turn to Oxile or to be fair, similar technologies than what you're doing. Yeah. Because if you have just long chain, then maybe there is a technology for that. If you have just yeah. short chain, then maybe there's a technology for that. But yeah. if you have the full mix with Genix and everything in between, yeah. then you need a full spectrum. Can you quantify in the market how many people can say, oh, we have just that one? And how many people say, ah, we're not that sure and maybe we should shoot at the broad range? That's a really great question, right? Because in the market, when you look at, I don't know, like Hall technology or supercritical oxidation, they do the complete spectra as well, right? Everything is gone, so it's complete defluorination. But then you also have, let's say, electrochemical oxidation, where there are some open questions, like, is the long chain becoming short chain? And what is happening to the short chain? The data there, from many aspects, be it literature data, or also be it like commercial data from a pilot, that is really missing for me to, to see how validated that is. So there's a question mark there, which is also a question mark that the customers bring to us when they talk to us about electrochemical oxidation use, right? We're not absolutely convinced if it's the broad spectra removal. But that is also the reason why we put so much emphasis on measuring down to C2 because you should be able to prove to the customer it is the broad spectra removal, of course. And broad spectra truly starts from ultra long to ultra short. That is how we define broad spectra and oxide. It is not just c 8 becoming C5. That's not true broad spectra. And today what we see in the market is when it comes to, let's say, um, absorption technologies or concentration technologies, even vital right, filtration, it is selective in a way, right? So when you talk about activated carbon, great for long chain. According to the EPA's own website, horrible for medium and short chain. And it's something we have tested in the labs ourselves to benchmark ourselves against those technologies. And that's a really big plus. Not to even forget that you have a secondary waste problem with those 
those technologies. It's not a true destruction. So even there, being selective is a really bad thing to have because you're not even solving the problem. So when a customer... That is one key part of the problem because yeah. there's PFAS removal and there's PFAS elimination. You do PFAS elimination and I would totally agree with you that you're not really solving the problem if you're just doing removal. Yeah. Yet the regulation will yeah. push for removal, not elimination. So you might be solving better the problem, but if yeah. the regulation doesn't incentivize to do that, that yeah. might be a problem for you. At the end of the day, the regulation is not saying absorb and not destruct. They're saying treat the water and meet the regulations, right? Mm -hmm. In the most cost-effective, uh, scalable manner, and to also ensure the customers can afford that technology. So regulation is not coming and saying you can't destroy, you have to just remove. Regulation is saying meet the regulations that are more stricter and stricter, which is also our pitch to our customers who are absorbing, let's say, for example, example, and they can't absorb the medium and short chain. We have to look at what the regulations are actually saying. They're saying, let's say, remove 100 PPT of 12 different PFAS compounds or 50 PPT in the Benelux region, which is even more stricter, for 12 different PFAS compounds. And if you're doing absorption or filtration, you can't meet those criteria. With complex industrial wastewater matrix, for example, it absolutely does not scale, it is not cost-effective, and they can't meet the regulations. Then the conversation is more interesting. We destroy, okay, they don't want to pay for destruction, but we do help them meet the regulations. And the kicker for us is not just that we do broad spectra PFAS removal, we do that in one of our most cost effective and scalable manner as well, which is why customers come to us. Because first you prove to them it works, and then we show them the kicker of the technology, how scalable it is, how easy to modularize it is, and how low on the capex it is and opex it is for them. The energy cost is where we are really proud to show the data and prove it. It has been validated last year in the pilots as well on customer sites, how wonderful our energy data is for this broad spectra removal. Then the question is, why would someone want to absorb and filter when they don't meet the regulations? And there is a technology in the market that actually helps them meet the regulations in a cost-effective manner that they can actually afford. Let me try to put that in my words and you tell me if I understand that. You can go for lower cost mm -hmm. removal if you go for activated carbon on or ion exchange, yes. which is limited on some ends, not the same ends for ion exchange and for activated carbon, but yeah. it's limited on some ends. And then you still have a brine in the ion exchange or an activated yeah. carbon in activated carbon, which you need to burn or to treat in, in whatever ways. You could go to reverse osmosis, mm -hmm. in which case you would take out everything yeah. and then you would have a concentrated brine, which you can still send somewhere to be burned. That works. If you burn it to the right temperatures, it doesn't even go to the air. It's full mineralization. But that is yeah. probably going to be prohibitively expensive. Yeah. And you're saying there's probably an in-between, which is slightly more expensive than activated carbon or ion exchange, yeah. but enables you to remove Everything, everything and that's what you do exactly so we also help our customers not be burdened with personnel costs where they have to have people on site to take care of the secondary waste where they have to off truck this water pay for that and you're right you're also hearing more and more not all incinerators burn PFAS at the right temperature I was talking to a customer in the US who was saying how they have to wait for months to be able to get a slot to burn that because there are a limited number of incinerators that can even burn PFAS so that is also another burden right they're storing it they have this extra cost associated with that so we are looking at the full life cycle of how to make a customer happy. It's not just about the quick fix that up concentrated and then they're storing it. How long is that sustainable, right? Yeah, the traditional path would be to go to a cement factory, which would then burn that in the cement factory, yeah, but yeah. not to the right temperatures, which means yeah. that the PFAS, which you very carefully removed from water, is now in the air, yeah, yeah. which is probably not better. There's a full question of value chain yeah. in that. I'm coming back to what you said about your industrial test. And wait, before we go into that, I think yeah. we have to do some housekeeping and to bring everybody up to date with the state of the art with what you're doing. You're doing, how can I say that in a super simple, probably wrong way, a catalytic oxidation. So it's a catalytic oxidation reduction process, yes. So the core of your technology is your super specific catalyst, which mm -hmm. then can be activated by almost any kind of energy. Not almost all. We are quite selective in that. We do mechanical energy sources, right? So there is a huge pool we can harness from the existing water infrastructure, bubbling, vibrations, the flow of the water. We design our reactors in such a manner that you can really use the flow of the water as an active energy source. It's designed in a way that the velocity is now so turbulent in the water. There's even cavitation in the water from that process that is really then taken up, scavenged by the catalyst. So this catalyst takes mechanical energy 
translate that into a chemical energy process, basically. For example, if you have electrochemical oxidation, you pass electricity into electrodes, and then you have the chemical energy process. But here we're taking much more energy efficient resources, like the bubbling in the water, the flow of the water itself, for example, to do this activation. And the end result is the same. You have a species of, let's say, hydrated electrons, hydroxyl radicals that are formed. We know how reductive in nature hydrated electrons are. They're really good at destabilizing the CF bond. And then we have a bunch of really oxidated species like hydroxyl radicals, CO2 radicals, SO4 radicals. So they are oxidizing and reducing at the same time. But the kicker for us is we're taking mechanical energy, which is so low in energy, as an activator, which is amazing materials catalyst, is transforming into chemical energy. So it's not like we're reinventing the wheel on the chemistry, but we're absolutely reinventing the wheel on how we activate, how we put energy to do chemical reactions. And that's why we have such low OPEX numbers. And that's the way that we have proven this repeatedly, how well the OPEX scales. As soon as you even go larger on the scale, how much better it's going to scale in the favor of lowering the energy even more. I just want to repeat that because it's crazy. I read one of your case studies and it was saying that your catalyst is activated by the vibrations. I was like, I must have misread that. <laughs> I, I came back, I reread and said, no, there really, it must be a typo. And then I looked, no, indeed, you're taking yeah. So that means usually we are used to, if you look, for instance, at forward osmosis, they would take waste heat yeah. in a plant and try to valorize that to recover yeah. the draw. But you're saying that there are much more sources of wasted energy, which you can yeah. leverage, yeah. beat the bubbles, the flow and all of that. I just want to emphasize how crazy interesting that is. That is interesting. <laughs> but only because you have that very specific catalyst. The very, very, very core of oxide is that catalyst. Our technology platform is beyond that one catalyst at this point, which I'm really proud of. But that was a spark of founding oxide, right? So when we discovered this amazing material that we were able to act with so many different mechanical energy sources, which we love because the water industry already has those energy sources, right? So it exists in the existing infrastructure. So customers don't have to worry about, oh, this is a brand new tech. We don't even know how to enforce it. Those energy sources are existing. It's about us adding a catalyst there now. That's why the customers find this really, really interesting. We're not bringing a new tech that they're not used to. We're saying our tech will go where your tech exists today. And this lowers the capex even more. So now that we've done the housekeeping, <laughs> there's one thing across all your case studies, which is one OPEX figure, which you're mm -hmm every time, which says you are two to six times cheaper in OPEX yeah. than what? <laughs> then actually other destruction tech. So we're not comparing ourselves to activated carbon ion exchange resin. It is hard to compare yourselves on the energy values to activated carbon if you purely look at like just the water passing through activated carbon and being absorbed. What is the OPEX there? On the energy at least, right? So we're talking about destruction tech out there on the market. And yes, we do say two to six times, but we also give this number where if you look at our energy values against Kivo or HAL technologies or even electrochemical oxidation technologies on the reported commercial data of some of the startups and companies out there, it is not just six times higher, it's more than 15 times higher. And this is coming from, first of all, the data that we have gathered from the pilots we ran last year on on-site pilots, fully in the hands of a customer. So they were collecting this data. It's not even our data to report. And there we were reporting between two to four kilowatt hours per meter cube of energy values, right? And that was on the pilot scale, which was not optimized for energy at all. It was optimized for performance and giving it super flexibility to try different energy sources. It was not optimized for energy. Now, when we talk about our actual commercial product, there we are going to be even below one kilowatt hours per meter cube. And that opens this whole other field of we're not even 15 times lower energy. We are way, way lower, especially if you look at the best available destruction tech on the market. So we compare ourselves to destruction tech, not to absorption or filtration. But even if you look at like reverse osmosis or nanofiltration, they are in this range of one kilowatt hours a meter cube. We are actually competing with them on energy while not creating any secondary waste. So this is why we call ourselves, we are going to be the category defining company when it comes to destruction tech for PFAS. First, from an older version of me 10 years ago, I have to scream out that if you compare it to activated carbon, Switzerland did that. Yeah. They did the full comparison. What is the best? Remove yeah. micropollutants at the yeah. Time ozone or activated carbon, and absolutely like you said, in the plant, activated carbon will have much less energy yeah. use. But what Switzerland did at the time is that they looked at the food cycle yeah. of activated carbon from activation, transport, usage, mm -hmm. transport, reactivation, or yeah. disposal. And if you take all of that, it was yeah. above ozone. So if yes. you are yourself six times better than ozone, I yeah. would expect you to be even six to eight times range. better than activated carbon. So exactly, and then you still have a secondary waste, waste which problem. you don't have in, in your case. Or so. even the broad spectra not being removed with activated carbon as well, like short chain, ultra short chain. You can't remove it activated carbon that well. So now I'm 200 episodes into 
that podcast. And there's one sentence which was probably the most used on that podcast, which is mm -hmm. there is no silver bullet in water. Yeah. So what is the limitation of your technology? When would it not be a fit or yeah. what would be a drawback in some use cases? We can't just say we do everything in the water space of PFAS. That would be very irresponsible to say. Why our numbers are so good on the OPEX, for example, is because we are not talking about super concentrated industrial waste where you have, for example, a huge COD matrix, 10,000 ppm or something, you know, or you have a lot of nitrates or ammonia. When you have that, your radical species, your hydrate electrons will also compete for that. And many of these species are very easy to treat over PFAS. So they will always win. So we know our niche, for example, right? We know the upper limits of COD, BOD we want to handle, for example. On the concentration of PFAS, there really is no upper limit. We have proven to customers we can start with very low PPT ranges of PFAS to all the way to like tens of PPM, for example, even hundreds of PPM. 10,000 PPM is the last project we did where we could show how well that worked. As long as the matrix is manageable. And when I mean manageable, I don't want the matrix to be thousands of PPM, which you would see, for example, in many industrial water matrices. There are approach to still help those customers is what kind of partnerships do we need to make sure that we have a good pretreatment where the existing COD, BOD, which is not so problematic, can be removed by traditional methods at a low cost for them. And then we are left with the super interesting concentrated PFAS water, which is where we come into play, right? And this also brings the question for a startup, like which is the low hanging fruit in the market? Which kind of water do you not need these partnerships right away? And where you need it? That's also how we prioritize. There's some projects where we can just jump in tomorrow and we don't need these extensive pretreatments. And then there's some cases that are really lucrative for us, but you need a pretreatment. So what kind of partnership do we need, right? So we are careful about that we prioritize projects based on that as well because what is would be an absolute shame is to use these amazing radicals to destroy something which is a biodegradable organic matrix like that's an absolute shame we also educate our customers on that we can do that but why would you want to pay for that when there's an easier better method to do that it's always about educating your stakeholders in many cases they have no idea about water treatment so you really have to advocate for their benefit because it's good for us we can do the whole thing and they'll pay for that but there's a better method of treating the matrix with which is not PFAS related. If I try to translate that, that means you become a super cool solution for the upgrade of an existing facility. Because if they already have wastewater treatments, they yeah. probably already discharge to today's limit, which means yeah. BOD, COD, exactly, yeah. NP, everything is taken care of. Yeah. Now on top of that, they need to tackle PFAS, PFAS or yeah. another type of micropollutant. But that means the scavengers present in that matrix are limited. So yeah. you can just plug and play yeah. your solution at the back end of that. That's exactly how we do the projects today as well. We are the last step of the treatment process, for example, for our customers. But for projects like environmental remediation use cases, like when we treat, let's say, groundwater or when we treat really PFAS contaminated soil water, for example, there we just go, we plug and play and we can do with a matrix really well for a really complicated industrial wastewater process matrix. That's where we say we need a pretreatment and we come end of the pipeline because you're right, they do have something already installed. They can't just discharge the water to minutes without a pretreatment. It doesn't act as a roadblock for us, but we are very careful. We need to be at the end of the pipeline and not in between there to make the most value for our customers, basically. This end of the pipeline, and again, Switzerland was one of the yeah. fast movers. We're sitting in Switzerland, yeah. so it makes about sense to, to use the Swiss example. But one of the big topics for this end of the pipeline when you were putting oxidation at yeah. the very end was, yeah, right, we're removing what we don't want, but we're creating stuff which we yeah. don't know. And so that is the reason why when ozonation or advanced oxidation yeah. processes were put as a last step, the recommendation was, oh, maybe you want to put a sand filter behind yeah. that or an MBBR or something yeah. which would just take this biodegradable exactly. oxidation byproduct. In your case, you even even had a case where you had bromine in the water bromine yeah. in the water which oxidates to bromate yes. bromate is not controlled by the regulation on wastewater but is controlled yeah. by the regulation on drinking water yeah. so if you're discharging to something which might be drunk by someone one day you yeah. probably want to avoid bromate and you could show that you're not creating any bromate, bromate. Yeah. what is the magic trick that oxidation is creating byproducts which yeah. we don't want but your oxidation doesn't I think that's from the municipal treatment plant case study that we ran a few years ago at a pilot so in that particular case, that was a very interesting use case for us. That's also why we took it is because they had tried ozone technology there. And that particular wastewater plant had some industrial water coming in. So there was a lot of bromine in there. And we did like back to back studies. There was ozonation treatment running. Our treatment was running. Customers were taking the sample to better understand which of the two oxidation treatments would form bromate. It was a no brainer. The ozone would. It's O3 radicals reacts with bromine forms BrO3 bromate. And our oxidation mechanism is really different. We have hydrated electrons. We have OH 
oldest radicals. We don't have the O3 radicals, for example. And we do have a much higher oxidation power as well. What we saw in that case study from the help of customers who helped analyze the water, there was no bromate formation at all, but ozone treatment formed a decent amount of bromate, which was in the carcinogenic levels. And one interesting thing that we think, because we don't have the exact mechanism here, is that we probably go from bromine to even BR to gas. Like we form the gaseous version of that. That was a hypothesis the customer put who had their own technical team there. And I think here, if you do a mass balance and you look at the vapor level and liquid level, you can do the mass balance and figure out where does the bromine go, but it absolutely does not form the bromate radical. And that was something we were not even sure of. If what do we form? So the customer took the leap of faith and helped us analyze it. And that was a really great data to have. But the reason we think that is the case is because we don't rely on one or two kinds of radicals like the O3 radicals or the OH radicals only. We have a bunch of different things happening. And many of these species are very reductive, very oxidative. So it's absolutely possible you can go from bromine to BR2 instead of ever forming bromate. Which if you think about the chemistry of bromate formation, it's bromine in the water. And if you have O3 radicals, you will form BRO3. It's just, and we have no ozone radicals in the process, right? So that's one of our hypotheses. And in chemistry like this, you have to have some hypothesis going with the chemical reactions because it's really hard to pinpoint the exact mechanism. But what stood out was the end data. There was no bromate formation. It was good to know. And that was actually the first pilot we ever ran after one month of founding the company. So it was the first thing we ever did. So that was a good thing to know early on that we're not making toxic byproducts. I think that's an interesting one because it makes sense. I didn't know it was the first one you ran, but now it makes much more sense because you can prove a lot of stuff at that scale. Yeah. Yet, when I look at the results of your pilot there, yeah. you had two good results. Nothing forces you to be so effective. Mm-hmm. The low says 80%. Yeah. If you're hitting 90 or more, yeah. good for you, yeah. but the low doesn't require that. Yeah. So it can give the sense to an operator that, mm, I don't want to overpay. Yeah. I'm yeah. not paid to wash water than white. Yeah. And probably today... I wouldn't see you targeting that mm-hmm. specific niche because it's probably not where your crowd is. So is it a realization which you did mm-hmm. within the pilots or what's the what's the story there? The first pilot we did that it was a paid pilot. The customer had tried a lot of things. They were benchmarking us. It was a no-brainer as a young startup to jump into a paid pilot where you get benchmark data. And I always think as a startup in water, get your first pilot and proof as soon as possible, especially if it's a paid one. Nothing like it, right? So that was my own egoistic reason to say yes to that. Even if I absolutely do not believe that was our first market segment at the point. Talking just about the, the million liter per day treatment capacity. As a startup, you know you're not going to be there. That cannot be your first project or your first customer unless you have a lot of revenue and capital to be able to build the infrastructure you need. So we knew that that's not the most attractive market segment for us today, but it was a great validation point for the mm-hmm. technology. From that perspective, we didn't pivot from municipal. We always knew it's not the right one. It was just the first validated project a customer was running and also willing to share the data everywhere, which they did. Even then we knew if we have to get to the market as soon as possible, we always talked about decentralization, decentralization, decentralization from the very first day. And that is still true to this day is how we look at a product and how we really believe you can solve the problem of water. You have to decentralize as much as possible. I think here we have to make a definition check because usually on that microphone where we're discussing yeah. decentralization, we're thinking on-site water reuse in your basement. So in the communal space, mm-hmm. in B2C markets and stuff like that, yeah. that's not what you're discussing here. You're saying decentralization, go at the source, industrial exactly. source of pollutions yeah. and knock it down as long as it's in a stream which is manageable in terms yeah. of volume and before it's diluted with a whole soup. Exactly. That's one way, but I have to also like add a bit of nuance here because when you do environmental remediation projects and you have a concentrated groundwater source, that is also a point source because if you don't treat it there and you have like thousands of PPT of PFAS in the groundwater source, that for me is still decentralization because if you don't treat it there, it becomes a drinking water of a village downstream. So we also call that decentralization, even if the flow rates are much larger, but it is really a point source with very high concentration of PFAS, which you can't even imagine you would find in the groundwater, but we do find that. So for us, an environmental remediation project, or let's say a soil wash project with a lot of PFAS, when I say a lot, I really mean in thousands PPT, is a very attractive use case to apply a technology and still call it decentralized. Let's be specific on this one, because that was one of your case studies, which yeah. surprised me because it's really not where I was expecting you, but yeah. then I read it and 
I thought, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I really missed that use case. So tell me yeah. the story of that PFAS remediation project in Groundwater. This is a pilot we started last year. It was a six-month-long pilot. It was with one of our industrial customers, and we were already doing like process water treatment for them when they brought this really interesting use case of having contaminated the groundwater, but not just PFAS, but also pesticides, actually, and requiring a one solution that fits all their problems because they were using sand filters, activated carbon, a bunch of other things to remove different versions of it and not still being able to meet their PFAS limits that they had to meet because they had medium and short shade PFAS in it. And activated carbon after one or two months was getting saturated over time. So they were not able to meet their regulations. And they also had a lot of fluctuations in the incoming water. Some days they had 500, 700 PPT and some days they had thousands. And there's no way you have some kind of real-time feedback check. So some days you can meet, some days you just absolutely did not meet the regulation. So we came into this as a situation which felt like a tricky situation. You don't have any idea what you're treating. They don't want to use a a lot of different pre-treatments. They just want you to do the whole thing. And that's basically what we did. There was a pump and treat project where we pumped the groundwater that was really contaminated. We treated it in a bad cycle with our reactor and we put it back into the groundwater table, taking samples before and after, of course. A very tightly monitored study for six months where the customers took samples every day. They shipped the same samples to our labs as well. We checked them here. They checked them with their own labs. We validated the whole data, found really good you know, match in the data, uh, which was really important for us because we were collecting a lot more data data than one or two samples. We were refining our machine learning models on that data as well. We were collecting hundreds of samples per week, for example, from that study. And what we did in the six months, which was really fascinating for me, for the first three months, we treated directly the groundwater, which ranged the concentration of PFAS from 500 to a few thousand PPT. Mm -hmm. And for the last three months, we treated the nanofiltration reject water. So they also applied a nanofiltration technology on site to see which way should the customer go. And we proposed to them, can we prove to you for the next three months, we can treat that. And and still make it a very cost-effective solution for you. And there, the PFAS concentration would go up to like 7,000 PPT, for example. So quite high. And what we could show to them was for both of these phases of the project, our energy values were between 2 to 4 kilowatt hours per meter cube. It did not significantly vary. And this change of energy values to 4 kilowatt hours per meter cube from 2 from phase 1 was mostly because we had less water that we were collecting mm -hmm. from the data filtration. It was not because of our own energy values. And that was really fascinating to show that even if a customer has deployed a nanofiltration technology, technology, which has 5x concentration, for them, in terms of OPEX and catalyst use and all, their price does not vary a lot. So they could be reducing the flow rates that they have to treat by a nanofiltration, for example, by 5x, for example, or if you use foam fractionation by 10x, 20x, and they could treat that for them, really reduce that without absolutely going crazy with the price, for example. And that was a really interesting case study because not only did we show repeatedly for six months, 98, 99% removal every single day in a stable manner, also validating the the lifetime of the catalyst, also showing that we were removing the broad spectra every single day. But what was really also fascinating was we were also removing the pesticide as well. Of course we were. If you remove the PFAS, you also remove the pesticide. And the energy values is where the customer was like really surprised how low the energy was consistently. And of course, in our own labs, we don't just measure 12 PFAS compounds. We were looking for short chain, ultra short chain and measuring them and not finding them. And that was really, really valuable data for us. And in that pilot, we also went one step ahead. We also looked at the water quality data. The question is always if you do oxidation or reduction, you could be forming a lot of different degradation byproducts, which you can't even measure, right? Because you're looking for 12 compounds. What if you're forming hundreds of others? And a common theme here is if there's any CF byproduct you're forming, that's not good. You should not have that, but you can't be screening for thousands of unknowns. And what we discovered was something called a Calyx test. It's a test that the EPA was recommending. They might go in that direction because if you have any CF bond, this biological essay, which is basically a thyroid response test in the end, would pick up the signal from the CF bond being formed as a byproduct and you would see a negative response come out in the Calyx test. So if by default you're forming any other degradation byproduct that had CF bonds in it and your HPLC measurements can't pick it because you don't even know it's there, this Calyx test would absolutely pick that. And we ran multiple of these Calyx tests and one really cool benchmark that we have as a company is that we also benchmark that as a control against bottled water you buy from the supermarket but you know that it has some PFAS in it, right? And we could show that our data after treatment has less of almost a negligible thyroid response, much better than the drinking water you buy from a store, which we know maybe have 5, 10 PPT or PFAS. And that for me, as a founder of this company, was such an amazing thing to show. Because we know eventually EPA, other regulators will move towards tests like that, because that is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what constitution of PFAS you have, it matters is the water safe for discharge. And if a bioassay picks up a negative thyroid response to CF bond, that's a problem. This is even 
us saying there is no C2, no C1, no C3 because the test would have picked it up. And we ran multiple of these samples. And for me, that was really great to show. And the team was the happiest I've seen that day because we're better than drinking bottled water in terms of PFAS response. That was another great thing that came out of the pilot. You're opening many new doors. There are two I'd like to explore. The EPA will discuss it yeah. later. I just want to mention that you have more case studies on the website. It will just cost you your email. The website is in the <laughs> description. You will get access to, to the case studies. It was a good read for me, so I guess it would be a good read for other people. It gives you examples, not the names, which got me curious, but yeah, I understand for obvious reasons. I'm coming to what you just said. You mentioned how you use that to train your machine learning, how you are able to do analysis here, how you're developing a bioessay, how you're also explaining how you're doing real-time monitoring of yeah. what takes time. Yeah. And that is almost a subcategory of the PFAS market, which yes. didn't get in the first place the, the attention it deserved. But which more and more, if you look at what Fred Sense is doing, if you look at yeah. what um, Skion just invested in a company who's doing that as well, it just makes sense. Yeah. If now there's a regulation on PFAS and the only way to measure your PFAS is to do GCMS or LCMS in labs which are accredited for that, that's going to take weeks, if not months. Yeah. And we heard utilities a couple of weeks ago in a Congress which are saying exactly that, that they yeah. had to insource the labs just because they yeah. can't afford to wait two months to get a result. And now I hear that you, of course took that up in the market and you spotted an opportunity mm -hmm. and something where you can bring your expertise. So yeah. what do you intend to develop with this mm -hmm. machine learning element? I guess you don't become a lab down the line, right? Where do you play in that sphere? That's an excellent question. That's one element I think we didn't cover four years ago because that was a thought process that I had. And I'm happy that after four years, it's not a thought anymore. It's not even something that what do we intend to develop is what we've already developed and are deploying. You're right. There's one thing called treatment of PFAS water, but if you can't monitor it, your customers don't know what they're paying for. And more importantly, you don't know if you're protecting the environment. And for us as a company, a third reason why we wanted to develop this was also to make sure we can take guarantees for the process and charge the customers for that guarantee. And even in that same process, regulate as a feedback loop, right? The energy needs. If you have already met the discharge limits in 30 minutes instead of the 60 minutes that you thought you needed because incoming water had low PFAS, don't spend more energy for 30 more minutes. That That's the no-brainer for us. And this is something we picked up on the pilot last year. And some days we had reached the discharge limit within the first 25 minutes and we were still treating for another hour and just wasting energy for the customer. So it became a no-brainer why we started collecting all of this data to let's start deploying this. What we have developed here in a very easy manner is we take a bunch of data, really noisy data from 10 different sensors, 12 different sensors that are doing real-time monitoring of water. It doesn't give you anything meaningful. So if you look at all the 12 different data points, it's a bunch of noise, but there are patterns there. And that's exactly where machine learning comes into place. 12 parameters like COT, we take a temperature, lot of different things, pressure. Oxidation reduction potential, for example, pH, temperature, absorbance of different things. So there's a bunch of things there that we Basic use. boring parameters. Basic boring parameters uh, with some modification of some sensors that we have modified with the help of our sensor partners that have developed special sensors for, for our exact needs. But basically bulk values, nothing crazy is happening there. But because we have access to our own labs here, which runs hundreds of samples overnight, we do a lot of correlation. Every minute we'll take a water sample analyze with HPLC because we invested so heavily in that early on. And then you start seeing beautiful patterns emerge from this noise. It took us a few years to get to the stage, but what we have developed so far, for example, for drinking water quality or for groundwater use case application, that's where I find this so fascinating. We can say with a 99% accuracy, if a customer has met their 100 people to discharge limit, no matter what data you feed, no matter from where you get the groundwater, and we've tested it repeatedly, we have stress tested it repeatedly, on site in the lab, spike water, we've done everything. 99% of the time, you can get a very positive reply that you have met the regulation of 100 PPT. We're also refining it down to the 50 PPT mark, which we believe is definitely possible. We have also employed this, what happens if you have an up-concentrated water with nanofiltration or foam fractionation, even there we have a 99% accuracy. You have to keep refining the models, feed new data into that, but our machine learning models are quite robust for drinking water and groundwater applications, meaning a customer would just know every single time every minute when they have met the 100 people to discharge limit. And this data is coming to them on the cloud platform. It's being monitored. And for us to know if it's not met, we keep the treatment longer, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it takes. And it's obviously a service that is super unique, really valuable, that we do value-based pricing and we charge them. It has a lot of things. The customers don't have to take samples all the time and wait for weeks and months to know how well it's going to get this data in real time. And secondly, they don't pay for energy when they don't have to. And this is another reason how we pitch it to them, how much 
money they would have saved. If this whole treatment was running for a month, there were days we overtreated. We didn't have to. And that's saving that they could just give to us in terms of revenue. And that's as a company with a mission to protect the health of our water bodies forever against forever chemicals, it goes hand in hand. If you can't monitor in real time, how can you guarantee a treatment is working? Please someone explain that to me because everyone is taking process guarantees. How are you taking a process guarantee when you wait for weeks to know if the process worked? Okay, I need to be the devil's advocate. You're entirely right yeah. that before I become the devil's advocate, <laughs> now I become the devil's advocate. A guarantee, yeah. especially when it's given by an OEM or an EPC, yeah. is there to never be enforced. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be written in a way that it can't never be enforced, which yeah. means even the law sometimes goes in that direction. If you look at the Swiss yeah. law on micropollutants, it yeah. says you take a sample one time a month yeah. and you need to conform with the 80% one time a month. And yeah. if you miss the mark one, depending on the content, sometimes yeah. even two months in the year, it's still okay, which means yeah. you basically have to 10 days in the year, be sure you're at 80%. If all yeah. the rest of the time everything's flowing through, not a big deal. Yeah. And you're now saying, oh, I need to do my job correctly and I need yeah, to yeah. ensure I'm removing everything. And yeah. I have proof that I'm, I don't want that. I just want yeah. to confirm with the regulation. I mean, that's a great question from a devil's advocate's perspective. <laughs> but see, when I say that Oxal is going to be the category defining company here, I really mean that from a long-term vision perspective. There are companies who set BATs. There are companies who set a standard. And if you set a metric which you are proven and it works, industry will follow. And this is our approach here as well. We are validating that it is possible to actually in real time model PFAS, which no one is doing. If you can't prove it, no one has to do it. And if you can prove it and offer this in a way that is affordable because you save them energy costs instead and they pay you for that. And many early adopters have used it and deployed it. You are setting up a true standard where you are changing the game. We're not a big water company who is doing the status quo and just putting everything down the line. What we want to make sure is this is not so expensive that no one's going to buy it then there's no point it is affordable customers can buy and enjoy this they are early adopters and we set a BAT around that what this means what it means to be doing real time morning of PFAS it's not a pipe dream it is a reality and we're bringing that to the market it is not the product the only product we are selling we are doing treatment but we know the value of that and we want to bring this to the market and today yes you're right you might need 10-20 samples a year because you can't do more than that because of good reasons you said logistical reasons but if you can do real-time monitoring and there's some customers who have tried that, deployed that, gave a testimonial for that and said, that's actually affordable. We even save money on the energy because of that. That's how you change the market. That's I, how you start a new trend. I think that's the absolute point, which is still, if I'm yeah. almost cynic and I'm saying, I don't care yeah. about removing the PFAS yeah. as long as I confirm with the regulation. Yeah. Still, just because it allows you to adjust the energy levels, just yeah. that means it's worth it. Yeah. So you ensure that you're doing your job 365 days a year because you really monitor everything which is happening. Yeah. And on top of that, you never wash white than white. If you see that after 20 yeah. minutes of the cycle, it's, it's treated, then stop applying energy. That, of course, that by itself would justify the approach. You mentioned you are also doing removal. Now, if I challenge you on that one, yeah. I would almost say that the monitoring element might be even easier with a lot of brackets around the mm-hmm. easier to mm-hmm. scale mm-hmm. because there you're agnostic of the technology yeah. whoever has to remove PFAS yeah. will need monitoring yeah. and when you follow the money and the investment in this sphere you see that that is a thesis Very which is growing whereas on the technology end, there will be hardcore fans of supercritical water oxidation, hardcore fans of reverse osmosis, hardcore yes. fans of activity carbon. And there, you will have to first breach their conviction barriers, and yeah. then you might have a chance to prove your point. So do you want to follow the two paths simultaneously, or mm-hmm. might you at some point pivot and say, we can also do removal, but here's the test and the monitoring and the real-time yeah. aspect? It's a great question. As a founder of a company who cares about this problem as a whole, I think about this all the time. There's an easier and faster way to get really profitable with the real-time monitoring. Easier again in brackets, nothing is easy in water, water right? (laughs) But I know what you mean, once you've proven it, it's easy to scale, right? You can really scale this much faster than hardware. Of course you can. But the question I ask when I think about this is, am I doing the absolute best with the technology we have in terms of how much impact we can make? Because if I'm still burning my customers with activated carbon and just monitoring what's left in the end, have they really met the regulations? Have they really protected the environment? And have we burdened them in the secondary ways that are still burning? I think when you ask a founder who's a founder who's impact driven our answer is never going to be let's do the easy thing and the fast thing our answer is always how can we do the right thing and still make it easy and scalable and for me these two things go hand in hand we do the treatment we give our customers a treatment that actually works and they can afford and there is no secondary waste there is no burning of this wastewater there is no releasing of PFAS into the air for future generations it is really a category defining treatment on its own and we also give them real time monitoring and in the future I can completely imagine that these are one track is so much more 
more profitable, it is not just tied to the treatment anymore. We offer this as a standalone to residential complex or households, to consumers in the end. That's a different discussion to have and a very, very important discussion to have. But for me, we need to do both things if we want to solve water. Because um, the easy thing is obviously the easiest thing to do. But as a founder, it's not the right thing to do. And if my treatment was burdened with high capex per performance, I would do the easy thing. But I know how well the treatment works and it's coming from the customers, how easy it is on the performance, how easy it is on the capex and opex affordability, the implementation, the use of it, it's a plug and play. Why would you not want to do a BAT on the treatment itself? And forget about the real-time monitoring. Some customers even ask that, like, why don't you just focus on the treatment because the treatment is so good? And then, of course, some people ask, ask why don't you do the other way around? And as a founder, I see because both are so valuable and so easy to implement, easy, we should do both at this point. And at some point, I'm absolutely convinced the real-time monitoring would be its own thing as a company that we might even have to think about just, you know, how do we just scale that? Because that is so easy to scale, to fuel innovation into the treatment from that even. Because I think we definitely have to keep the treatment up core and center. There's no point monitoring if the treatment up front is absolutely disastrous for the customers. I love your answer. So <laughs> you you give a very good answer to a shitty question. Oh, <laughs> kudos for that. <laughs> Before we open the EPA box, I have a last thing to share with you, which is last week I was at the Global Water Summit in London. There was a session led by Isle Utilities on 30 technologies mm -hmm. or water tech companies mm -hmm. which address micropollutants. They framed mm -hmm. it that way, but a yeah. lot of it was around PFAS. Then there was monitoring companies, treatment companies, and Oxide was one of the 30. Super it's good to know. I didn't know that. I, Thank you. <laughs> I, I tell you. So was, <laughs> super interesting session. But at some point, someone from Northumbrian Water raised a question from the room and said, yeah. you know what? That's great. But why don't we have like one place in the world where we would take the technologies and test all the technologies and then we have a clear benchmark? To which that brought back for me, memories of what Switzerland did, what Germany yeah, did, yeah. what Sweden did, what Netherlands did, and yeah. what France did, which already gave me a hint as to why that will never happen, because everybody will believe I'm a special snowflake, and if there's a comparison at a certain point and place on Earth, that is not going to apply to me. But on the principle and the surface of things, yeah. I would find that awesome if you you yeah. get to test your stuff on the yeah. same metrics, then an Clarity gets to test that stuff, 374 Water gets to test that stuff, a yeah. Pure Affinity gets, and so far and so on. Yeah. And then people have a clear result and then we can vary the metrics and we know, oh, yeah. if there's only short chain, then go for those. If there's exactly. all of those. Go that sounds awesome on the paper. Mm -hmm. I fear it will never happen. Would you think that would be a good thing if it happens? Or would you say, no, that's just nonsense because every water metrics is different and from your experience, you have to tune it all the time? I think if we can somehow get all the stakeholders involved to say yes to that it is an absolute amazing thing. It gives the customer a lot of transparency, right? It also gives you as a company the direct comparisons. There's no guessing. And to find your exact niche instead of finding it later once you employ or deploy the station, it doesn't work as good as a competition. In terms of your own transparency to scale the company, absolutely something I think we should aspire to do as, as founders of the company or leaders of the company. The question is, would it ever happen? That I don't know, that you'll have to ask other members of those companies as well. I think if you can make a really close study around that, okay, this is a use case. Let's say we want to focus on leachate water or you know groundwater. For this, these are the various parameters. You can design a close study around that. You can really vary the parameters, stress tests, right? And get a lot of really awesome data and then see for these parameters, which is perfect for this kind of leachate water, I'm the go-to company. And for the other ones, it's my nearest competition. That's fine. But then you know your exact market. From that perspective, of always benchmarking, collecting data and showing data transparently as we do at Oxal. I would love that. It's just a matter of question of how many other people will join you because it needs to be a group movement and it needs to be taken in the right spirit. And the spirit is to find our exact niche market where we are the best so we can focus and grow. That's a great mindset. If the mindset is I don't want to feel like I'm the worst in this company, every treatment is going to be worse than the other one in some regard. It's just a matter of like which stakeholders will join, who will pay for it, how much will it cost, and how will we transparently show you the data. I think as a principle, it's definitely amazing and maybe it could actually be facilitated one day. And if it happens, I think definitely Oxal is going to be participating very happily and collecting more data. And then everywhere we are great, we'll publish that on the website and say, we are great here. Come and join us. Why not? It helps us grow. Positive answer there. Which makes me a good segue to the EPA topic because we'll discuss mm -hmm. the regulation, what it changed is how it opens the market. But one of the things that EPA published along their regulation on the 4PPT of mm -hmm. PFAS in drinking water is a recommendation of technology. And their list of recommendation of technology is pretty simple. It's two technologies, yeah. activated carbon and ion exchange. Yeah. Yeah. And as much as I understand why they do that, because... Mm -hmm. 
drinking water is a sensitive field. You don't want to take a risk. So yeah. you go for the absolutely proven stuff. I would see that, that the role of a body like EPA or the European mm -hmm. Commission or this kind of, of yeah. levels to yeah. say at the end of the day, even if we're not directly subsidizing, it's going to be utilities. So yeah. public money involved. We want to have the best bang for our buck. Yeah. So we probably should be the one hosting this kind of benchmark to know yeah. if that's the use case, then you go for that, you go, that's and so far and so on. Was it a surprise for you that activated carbon and exchange were pushed? And second, mm -hmm. how do you react to that? Like, you're, okay, they yeah. defined that. Yeah. It's a six billion market, which flows by the window because, yeah. yeah. Absolutely not surprised that that was the outcome. Honestly, you didn't even have to read it. You just knew that's going to happen, right? Because otherwise there would have been a movement in the market for many years from EPA funded to understand other technologies and benchmark them because we don't see that because it's risk averse field and I get it public health and drinking water is quite a risk averse field but that should not be a reason not to look for innovation and new technologies it was not a surprise but of course a shame when I saw that because you have access to so much money and so much resources and you're such a trusted body that companies like Oxal will come and benchmark ourselves to see if you like us or not they have so much power and with great power comes a lot of responsibility doesn't it and I think that was kind of missed from my perspective we went with the safe, same old, same old. And if you have this, you know, long PFAS strategic roadmap, you're researching this for years, I would have liked to see something new and not just this, the same, these are the two BAT, just go with that, let's be safe. What happens to the waste? What happens to the long-term effects of the secondary waste? Yeah, let's not discuss that. Let's just do what is safe to do. And that was a bit of a shame for me, absolutely. And I just hope maybe on the EU side, someone, a, a different country maybe can take a leading role. I think Switzerland sometimes shocks people, like as we did with the micropollutants, 80% removal, you know, a decade ago. I think there's a room to play for some player, which can be a bit outrageous in this field. And it's not even outrageous. It's just doing the right thing, like benchmarking technologies, I think. And if nothing is good, don't implement them. Like no one's going to die. If you don't like any of the new technologies, don't use them. Use activated carbon. But at least let's test. Let's get the data. And I feel there needs to be a champion who needs to do that. If it's not a government agency, if it's not a, even a country, maybe an independent water panel or something. We need to have, we need to see something, I feel. The difficulty stays with this special snowflake aspect because Switzerland, yeah. as you said, did it with airbag. Yeah. Yeah. We did two series of studies. The first with activated carbon versus ozone, ozone but also is it block activated carbon? Is it powder yeah. activated yeah. carbon? Then France did the same. The study, the first was called Ampere. The second was called Armistic. And they did a bunch of... Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, every country redid the same study. Yeah. And at the time, I yeah. was selling ozone generators. So to me, that was awesome. Every time they were doing a study, they yeah. needed to buy an ozone generator. I was yeah. super happy. Yeah. But at the bottom line, it was stupid. Yeah. And I fear that that might happen again yeah. unless the dominant power in the market like EPA because they were the yes. fastest yes. to move would take the lead I agree and that's beyond my rent leads <laughs> me to my question on EPA which is do you sit on the wrong side of the Atlantic I don't think that actually at all in terms of the market at least right in terms of the opportunity you can create if anyone has seen the forever pollution map project we don't sit on the wrong side of the Atlantic here yes you might sit on the wrong side of the Atlantic because we don't have like someone like the EPA as one defining thing for a country but in terms of the market and the world what we see on the European side for a destruction tech for PFAS. And this is something we keep hearing from customers. Where are the European PFAS treatment companies? Everything is, seems to be concentrated on the other side. I think there's a huge opportunity to make here, especially in the Benelux region, the dark region in France, Italy, the hotspots of PFAS really. We have access to 11,000 plus sites that are severely contaminated that we know of. Forget about the ones we don't even know of yet. They're severely contaminated with over 100 PPT. Some, in some cases, thousands of PPT of PFAS. PFAS that need immediate help. And there's a lot of amazing traction from startups in, on the US side, but they're not going to be coming here in the next few years. So we need our own champions here. And I'm happy that Oxal exists here. We're helping whoever we can help fill this void. Any customer who is sick and tired of activated carbon ion exchange resin are burning their water, is looking for a destruction then that they can easily access, is a few hours away. We are here. So why would I want to go on the other side when there's a void absolutely here from the market perspective, at least? So that means that it's not a big deal for you to be on this side of the Atlantic because anyways you wouldn't be targeting the US there are US companies targeting that market you are very happy with the European market for the time being you know, we never say never is never right our goal is to focus on the European side because of the market opportunity here because of the number of customers we are talking to and how much problems they have but in the next four or five years of course you want to move the plunge there and if you want to be proven in the American market we know they will ask you for testimonials they'll ask you for references you're a new company entering that segment so once we have the testimonial built 
fleet, when we have the revenue fleet built, it's much easier to enter that space. I don't think it's prudent to jump in now when you have access to such local market, which is completely underserved. And the American companies already have the monopoly there. So I think you have to play to your strengths where there's absolutely a market here and then jump on the other side once you have proven yourself. But wouldn't that be a double-edged sword? Because in the same time, the American companies are going to be references in the US. And yeah. as the EPA has come with that regulation, chances are that they can build a bit faster in terms of local references. I mean, the water sector is what it is. Yeah. Everybody wants to be first to be second. So when the markets develop in Europe, they might come and say, hey, hi, I'm a Clarity, I'm Alonia, I'm 374 Water or whoever. Yeah. And I have a backlog of 20, 30 references in the US. Yeah. Maybe you yeah. should trust me a bit more than... A European company, yeah. right? I love the question. Absolutely, it's a risk you will take in that case. But we also have to see how big the American market is. So we know of like 11,000 sites here. We know there are access to 40,000 different sites in the US. It's a huge market there. And if you are showing repeatedly to your customers here in terms of how your performance is better, OPEX is better, the CAPEX is better. Sure, competition in the US has 20, 30 different projects, but you also might have the same number here with much better metrics. At the end of the day, the customer wants to pay less. For more. And if that's what you're building here, you can take that traction there. If you believe in the superiority of your tech, that should not be a fear to dilute the resources, be here and there. You should conquer the market that's easier to get, that's in desperate need of help. And your tech is so much superior anyway, so it should be fine to sell on the USBs that we offer. And I absolutely believe in that. I don't think we should dilute our resources right now. We should really be laser focused and help the customers who are telling us we desperate need help. And just let them speak for us on the other side of the Atlantic when the time is right. That's Tell it your resources. You give me the best segue. You raised money three years ago? We did a pre-seed round about two years ago. Yes. Okay. How does it look like for you? Do you target to grow like bootstrapped and profitably and so you don't need to raise again? Or do you intend to do like a big bang? <laughs> I heard you, you mentioned before we started recording that you're moving to bigger facilities. All of that obviously has a cost. Yeah. What is your path to scale and how do you see the next one, two and then long term? As a deep tech hardware based company, right, you will need a lot of capital and you have to be very, very smart on how you raise that. So far, we have raised 9 million in total. And of that, about just three has been from dilutive VC funded rounds. So we only raised one round so far it was a pre-seed round in 2022. Three million round, the rest six million is all non-dilutive. And I'm absolutely proud about that because for me, it is not about this ego match of which company raises how much, how much faster. I'm building a company that is sustainable, that is scalable, and that gives the value, the best value for the buck to every stakeholder, including my team, who all have stock in the company. I think about every single person before, can I raise a 20 million round at a worst dilution to show I am also a big player? That is not an ego play here. What does my company need for the next two years? How do I get that in the most responsible manner? And if I can apply for a non dilutive no, no strings attached grant that we always get. That is real money. We just got 2 million funding from the Swiss government two weeks ago. I take it. I would not take that and not dilute until I hit the next big milestone. We would always need to raise funding from a VC fund. Pre-seed alone will never cut it. It's absolutely clear we need a seed round, a series A, maybe even a B. I know that. We probably are looking at two, three more rounds. It is about just spacing them out and not falling for this craze of let's raise the next round. And there are many other water companies that have these amazing rounds they raised last year. They're also double of age, for example. The companies you mentioned, like Clarity, for example, I think they're seven, eight years old. We're not even four years old yet. We are getting to that state. So I'm not competing on that. I'm competing on how much we need to scale as fast as possible. And in this same direction, we are looking at a seed round as we speak. We are in the middle of fundraising for our seed round. And that is only coming because we are happy with the milestones we've reached so far. And once we close a seed round, we would already have the commercial product installed on a customer side quarter three of this year. And that's what we are raising the seed round on. That's a milestone that I can stand behind and say, in the last two years, that's what we use that small 3 million of VC funding to do. We took a technology from a lab to a full-scale product installation with 3 million. And that's my pitch to the VCs. If you give me more money, imagine what we'll do with that 3 million. Because we take every single penny really seriously and always look for non-dilutive. And that's what I take a lot of pride in. So that means your Series A is for when you're commercially ready to go so that it's just about pushing and making it happen faster because you've done all your preparation work and now you're ready, wheels on the ground. You just need a bigger engine. This year we're raising a seat because you only raise a pre-seat so far. Okay. So we are very careful with the terms. Our 
pre-seed was 3 million two years ago. This year, we're raising a seed round, 8 to 10 million. And that is coming for showing how one product looks like and how do we scale that to 10, 20, 100 different products in the next few years. And then comes a big Series A in a few years, which we have time for. And that is all going to be about expansion into different geographical regions, entering US, hopefully, for example, with that, but also upscaling the production facilities for our catalyst that we produce ourselves. And of course, team expansion. So really, really key things you need to do. But our seed run right now is to show we installed the first full-scale product and the customer is super happy. Now we need to like produce and manufacture and scale the production in a team, ops team and sales team to deliver the next 100 reactors before we raise a Series A in a few years. We are literally raising money to say, we did one, now we need to do 100 more. So we need the money for that. It's not just we need the money and we'll see what happens here. <laughs> we know what's happening already. I think we need to address your business model here. You mentioned how you are paid on the results. Mm -hmm. So I would expect you to do a kind of treatment as a service. Is mm -hmm. that right? We don't just do treatment as a service. We, we actually install reactors and the customers pay us for the CapEx of the reactor. And here on the CapEx, we are really like on the margin. We don't make any profit there. Like a 5% cross margin for safety is what we make. We don't want to be an expensive CapEx uh, company. We want the customers to be able to afford this technology that goes on site that they can own. They feel better about They paid for something and that's their technology installed on site. They can show to their investors, look, we paid for this. But it's on the OPEX where we really make the revenue. One of the elements of the OPEX is absolutely correct. It's a treatment, it's a service where we charge them for per meter cube treated water, for example. The second pillar, of course, is this real-time monitoring data we provide to them on the cloud platform, which has different tiers. The basic tier is, for example, have they met the regulation or not? In the future, there's also other tiers going to come for a short chain, medium chain, PFAS level, how they are being tracked, for example. There's going to be many different tiers, right? Because for us, the most difficult thing to measure in real time is PFAS. But the pesticides and the pharmaceuticals in the model, we measure really, really easily with those sensors. So we can also add those other layers for them so they get this full data, for example. Even more importantly, if the incoming water has more pesticides one day or not from the production facility. It's really valuable data for the customers from what we heard. So we charge them for different tier packages for the analysis services. And because our catalyst, for example, is a consumable, this is how we see it. We replace this once a year, whatever it needs, based on customer needs. It comes back to our facilities. We regenerate it, acid basic cleaning, nothing crazy needs to happen. If you see any minerals formed, which you will see after one year of use with heavy groundwater, we do acid basic cleaning. It's good to go to 99% removal efficiency in a day. And we sell that to the same customer or to a new customer. This is also factored into a business model. Catalyst replacement fee for our customers, for example. That's an important point because your website says you're recycling the catalyst. Yeah. And I was wondering if you're recycling it, you're taking it back and you're putting it in a landfill under <laughs> super <laughs> controlled environment. Yeah. But no, you're regenerating your catalyst. We regenerate and we recycle. By recycle, what we mean is, let's say there's a mechanical damage after five, six years of use. It can happen. We use mechanical energy as an activation source after all. What do you do with that material that's a little bit broken? Do you just throw it away because it doesn't have the right mechanical properties? Because it won't work perfectly if it's not mechanically the same material. We know that from the test we have done. It needs to have the right modulus, for example, for being transformed the mechanical into chemical energy. What we can do is we can dry the material, redissolve it the way we make a fresh batch and remake a whole material and it works absolutely the same way. And this is what we mean by recycle. Like we don't throw a single amount of that. We can dry, redissolve, make a fresh batch so we don't end up wasting anything. We don't necessarily save a lot more money by fully recycling it, for example. But it's part of the, the thesis of the company. We save maybe 20% on the cost, which is not a lot, but it makes sure that we are not wasting anything in the process. Why waste when you can recycle, even if you save 20% of the cost? So we regenerate for sure every six months, every year, depends upon what's in the water. But the recycling would happen every few years, for example, just to make sure nothing gets thrown away. So far, you're blessed with not having so many investors. Mm -hmm. And so you can take your decisions. You're the founder. You speak with your team. Now I'm going to take a view of if I were an investor in your company, which happily for you is not the case and happily in all the dimensions because I would <laughs> be a terrible investor. But if I was now to advise you on your long-term path, I would say what seems to me the moneymaker is twofold. The catalyst mm -hmm. and and all the OPEX story around the catalyst yeah. and the data as a service yeah. and all the OPEX story around that. Yeah. Get rid of the stupid hardware. Who yeah. wants to do a hardware? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. if I was to give you that worst and lamest piece of advice ever, yeah. I would tell you, great, for demonstration purposes, you needed to have it. But yeah. when you scale, build your factory, produce your catalyst, yeah. because yeah. that is what you want to have in-house. Yeah. Build your data lake, data cloud, whatever, and keep reinforcing it. And maybe you might even yeah. be able to extrapolate more than just PFAS. But outsource 
the hardware. It's currently completely outsourced. We don't make anything on the hardware. It is if a customer gives us a full scale contract, we give that to a manufacturing partner who makes it and installs it. So we are kind of like the middleman for that. That is already happening today. It's happening happening since last year actually. We will never be a hardware manufacturing company. That would be the absolute killer if that hardware enters our balance sheet. It does not. It's a money drain, and we don't get anything out of it. So that is a part of the puzzle that we have already kept ourselves out of. So when we talk about a revenue stream, it is really all recurring, and this is the reason also we believe how fast we can scale. It's also advice we also got from investors as well, of course. But it was always part of our thesis. The first time I pitched, I always said we don't want to be a hardware company, and the investors loved it. They're like, okay, that's the water company we can work with because hardware is not entering the balance sheet. We don't want that to enter a balance sheet. We don't gain anything from that at absolutely. If I see your thesis, if you see the the field in which you are, if I see your track record, and in the same time you don't want to raise money just right now because that's not the right point in time, I guess you must be getting a call every week from an investor who wants to invest and you have to say no. I mean, we are in the middle of active fundraising. We launched the fundraising process a few weeks ago, a month ago, and this is really exciting to see how many European investors are getting excited about water. In the US, I think there are even like proper water funds that are so old and so well established. And on this side of the Atlantic, it was always about like clean tech was about battery storage and CO2 removal and water was like, oh, water, no, there's no money in water. And that is really changing. I've seen this trend the last few years that people are thinking the next climate bet is water tech. So we're seeing that people are getting really excited about it. And it is our job to show it to them that you can make money with them because you have to always see who you're talking to. VCs want to make a good return on that. And if your business model is driven by recurring revenue, they see the light at the end of the tunnel. They see they're doing the right thing for climate tech. They see it's a valuable resource for which wars are going to be fought in the future and you actually make money off it. So how much of a win-win is that? And how many other water techs do you see who are destroying PFAS at scale in a commercial manner, a cost-effective and scalable manner? I don't know many of them in Europe. It makes us obviously a very good candidate and that is something we are seeing from the market, of course. And we obviously have a very clean storyline pitched, our focus markets, how the tech works, customer testimonials and the pipeline of customers. And what do we want to do with this money that we want to raise? That's story is there. That it's clear on your end and that it's super investable, I would absolutely believe. Now, when I was discussing with Julie Blissmillen from Aclarity, Mm -hmm. she was mentioning that she was pitching to 60 or 70 VCs when she Mm -hmm. prepared her Series A. I probably pitched 80 venture capitalists and I was learning a ton with every pitch, how to refine my pitch, but also what I was looking for. I learned pretty quickly if they didn't know what PFAS was, they were off my list. Then they would have to, you know, have to educate but not only educate, but that means that they don't understand what, I, what we're going through. They don't know They don't know the market. I don't want to, to blame mm-hmm. anyone. I mean, I'm not saying they should know everything. But from an education standpoint, do you need to explain to them where you act, what you do, and what's the field? Or are they super informed and that's a no-brainer? I mean, anyone who shoots us an email and says, let's have a call, they have checked what Oxal is doing and what Oxal is about. So they already come informed. I haven't spoken to a single investor who reached out to us or who reached out to who did not come prepared for the call. Because that is just bad homework. That hasn't happened in my viewpoint. Of course, they are not chemistry experts. So you will have to explain to them what mineralization means, what the byproduct formation could look like and how would you evaluate that. You might even have to educate them why long chain is easier than short chain to remove. This is my job to educate them on, but they absolutely understand what PFAS is. They absolutely understand they're not going anywhere tomorrow. And this is a real problem. But what I would say here is I would not shortlist investors if they only have a water background. I think that is limiting because they're, first of all, not so many water investors. But secondly, it's limiting because I think you need to bring the knowledge of VCs who have scaled successfully different climate tech and you want to bring that knowledge to water. If you just work with water companies, right, water investors, how easy to scale uh, other water companies? How many water unicorns do we know? Absolutely. Answer, right? There's not a lot. Meaning, maybe there's not absolutely everything right done by the water VCs out there. It's not a proven model. Whereas in the other climate tech segments, VCs have shown that they have brought new insights, new business models to scale climate tech companies. So why would I not want that insight on my board to help me think a bit different on water, right? Exactly. I want Oxal to be a unicorn. I want to understand how the CO2 capture industry did that. And I want that know-how in my company. And I don't just want to work with water investors. It's good to have a balance there, I think. You really want Oxal to be a unicorn. Absolutely. I had the only unicorn in that sector on the microphone with gradients. Yeah. And sure, it's an exciting path. 
But yeah. it's also a crazy fast-paced growth, which yeah. means you have to do series pre seed, seed, yeah. series yeah. A, series B, series C, series D. And by series D, you become a unicorn, but yeah. now they have to become a decacorn. There's the sky's the limit. Yeah. Yeah. Is it that path of ultra rapid growth, ultra scale, which you're following? Absolutely. I think it starts with the passion you have as a founder, mm -hmm. but also the team you are building technology around. Every single person here outside of this room in my company is a go-getter. Everyone believes in the business model we have. It's scalable, it's profitable. Everyone believes in the tech we have developed and we have benchmarked and how great it is. And they see a huge market opening up. The drivers that you need to have, the most important being the team. Without a team, there is no no company. We have an absolutely amazing team outside, 25 amazing go-getters. In their field, they are the experts. I know the least amount in any room I go to for any <laughs> meeting, which is how I know we will be a unicorn. These people are super passionate. They have left really, really well-paying jobs to join our mission right, as a startup because they believe in what we are doing. And this is the reason I have the best hope that we will be this unicorn because you need the team who works 150% and believes in the mission to go at 10 times higher speed. We have done a lot in less than four years of being founded. It's what the customers think, it's what our investors are seeing as well, how much we have done from the first idea we had four years ago to installing a full-scale commercial product on the customer site and getting a huge amount of gross margin on that as the first sale we have made just in less than four years, right? So I know what we have built in just four years and what is there still to do. And with the team that we have, I absolutely believe we can do that. We assembled an amazing management team last year. We got an amazing chief product officer, Tobias, last year, a water industry veteran who's a CP Yo now amazing with customs, understands water in and out. We also onboarded a chief operations officer last year, Dom. He was the chief operations officer of Climework for 12 years, right? So he has built and seen how do you build a unicorn in the CO2 capture space from the day one of it being founded. And for him to leave Climeworks and join our mission as our CEO tells you what we are trying to build here. We are building the unicorn in water. I absolutely believe that because of the people who are outside of this room and the ones we are yet to hire. We hire very selectively. We have this principle of if you don't match our values, these five values in the wall that we have, you are not going to make it work here. We work very fast. We don't take shortcuts. And the commitment to our customer is absolutely the key here. The passion you have when you're speaking about that is super communicative. So I, I can feel that. And it's very interesting on various levels to hear you say that because you're known to be like that powerhouse. And hearing you say that when you enter a discussion with some people of your team, you're the one knowing the less because they have all to be like specialists and experts in absolutely. every other field. It's just a testimony to what you're building here. Which is good news because that means we will have the occasion to do a sequel to this conversation, but not yeah. in four years, but in less time than that. Because if you're going hyper growth, I guess there's a lot to tell in maybe one or yeah. two years. I know your time is of value, so I don't want to, to spend too much of it. It was great to have you on the microphone today. Mm -hmm. If that's fine for you, I would switch to the rapid fire questions. Yeah. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the toughest challenge in your opinion for a water tech startup? Reducing time to deployment and making a product with as much less customization you would need to scale. What would be your best single piece of advice for the founders and managers of the about 1,000 early stage mm -hmm. startups? Build your first prototype and sell that to your first customer as soon as possible and just laser focus on that. What's the drop of knowledge you wish more investors know about the water sector? Oh, absolutely, on the European side, that there's a lot of money to be made in water, so start investing in water. That's a super important one, which is it's not like do that because it's good for your ESG. You can make more, do a lot of money on it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was your most unexpected partnership and what did it bring you? I mean, definitely when we got the term sheet from a, a lead investor for the pre-seed, we were not fundraising, they just came for coffee. We were known to have good coffee in the market. And the next day we got the term sheet. We really changed a lot of things because we were not fundraising. We raised a lot of non-dilute that year and absolutely changed the way we look at how do we hire, how do we fire, how do we scale, how we look at business models. And that was a really great catalyst that we were already thinking, but a reaffirmed version from a known VC. So super happy that we took the term sheet and closed around super fast. No, I understand why you insisted that I take a coffee, which was super good because <laughs> apparently you have a magical coffee. It's, which good. Also, it's good coffee. I, I feel the need to and the urge to invest in you now. That was the coffee. <laughs> uh, super short. Profitability or growth? Definitely growth. If you have the growth, profitability comes. What's the next profile you'll hire? Uh, we're looking for a chief commercial officer as we speak. So if you know anyone, spread the word. So... If that fits your description, you know how to contact Badger. The links are in the description. You want someone here, someone abroad, someone, what's the... In the beginning, definitely someone who is in person as much as possible, a few days a week, to get to know the team, to get to know the culture, to, 
touch the product with his hands or her hands, right? And this is a role that should be very remote. It's a lot of travel involved. But in the beginning, definitely encourage for the first six months, be as much as possible here. So you get to know us and then you can run the show as you want. When you hire for that person, are you looking for sector experience or startup experience? Definitely sector experience in the sense like someone who's amazing at like let's say, the commercial side or the water side. And of course, when we are hiring, we are checking their values. If these values don't match, you know it's not a good fit for a startup. So we don't look for startup the other way around. We look for experience and make sure that person has the right value and mindset, which is the startup mindset at the end. Opening new markets or doubling down on the current ones? Definitely opening new markets. The best PFAS structure, low capex, low apex, scalable market for our customers. So open new geographies, not new verticals. I think you can do both. You can even look at a geography that believe you can't do PFAS destruction at scale and actually go there and implement a solution to help them. You can do both things if the tech works and the economics works. What's that tool nobody speaks about you couldn't live without? I can't work without my teams. Uh, teams is where, the, you know, we all coordinate every single thing and it's on my phone, it's on my laptop, it's everywhere. I can't live without it. It guides my... Uh, calendar. It's super interesting you say that because when I put that question on the list, I was expecting people to give me like crazy answers. Mm -hmm. And what comes the most is Teams, Zoom, Google Hangouts. And so it feels like what's the most important nowadays to get away to have that connection. If it's not physical, yes. it has to be through a tool. Exactly. Yeah. What's the single piece of insight your ideal customer profile needs to hear right now? That if they're looking for a scalable, sustainable, effective technology that can help them meet the BFAST regulations and give them real-time monitoring data, a startup called Oxa that exists and we are ready to scale with them. Our commercial product is already going to be launched. So just come speak to us. We have something that will fit your needs. What are you desperately needing and want to raise an open call for right now? I think this is a great question. It comes hand in hand with the regulatory aspect, right? I think what I'm looking for is some kind of a better regulatory push when it comes to, do we have, I don't know, a better PFAS regulation on this side of the Atlantic as well? Do we enforce a better polluter pace? And how does that look like? Can we make it the same rule across all European countries so there's less ambiguity and fragmentation across the market, which will help us get there faster? It's all about making the regulations more uniform, harmonious, more implementable and for someone like Oxal to be benchmarked, you know, to say how great we are. And what can and should I do for you? If you see any customer who believes PFAS destruction is a horrible idea, tell them about Oxal and we'll change the mind in half an hour of a phone call. Please do that. That's a good one. Half an hour. Uh, that's a good benchmark. Yeah, if you can't <laughs> tell someone in half an hour how well your technology works, you're not doing it right. It should take you two minutes, actually. But yeah. Well, Fadja, it's been a pleasure to have you back on the microphone and to have it face to face it brings a new dimension and a new dynamic to it. So thanks a lot for welcoming me in your offices. If people want to follow up with you, what's the best place to redirect them to? Our LinkedIn, we're quite active there. Are emails, um, you know, we reach out to every new lead that comes via email. So LinkedIn and email is always the best way. So as always, the links are in the description. That's probably what you want to check out thanks a lot and Thank i wish to yeah. have the follow-up with you rather sooner, sooner than later this time, right? <laughs> you're accelerating now yes what can you apply from everything fajr just shared what can you steal and take home well quite a lot if you ask me starting with the seven insights i wrote down and number one customer driven development oxile shifted its focus based on market feedback specifically targeting pfas after recognizing a high demand in customer inquiries as Fadger shared, we listen to the market, we listen to all the inbound leads that we got from customers and 90% plus of them were PFAS related. So we listened, we talked to our customers and we felt a real urgency there. You can apply this in actionable steps. First, identify key market needs. Regularly engage with potential customers through surveys, industry conferences and direct outreach. Then align product features. Develop or adapt your product features based on feedback received. And one important rule here that Fadger shared me, never kick off an R&D project if there's not a customer name on it. Finally, validate the solutions with stakeholders, use pilot projects or beta testing with early adopters to validate your technology, which leads us very naturally to number two, pilot strategically and prove quickly. Oxile quickly moves from concept to piloting, which underlines the importance of early real-world application and testing to refine and prove their technology. Listen to the velocity we're discussing here with this example. One of the most interesting projects we got last year was from an industrial wastewater customer, and they only had C4s in there, C4 PFAS compounds. Super tricky water, just a bunch of PFB in there, super high concentration, and they went everywhere. And then they came to Oxile as an inbound lead, and we're still working with them, and we're going on-site with them this summer. So 
in concrete terms, select impactful pilot projects. Choose pilot projects strategically to showcase your tech's effectiveness. Gather and analyze data, collect comprehensive performance data during the pilot phase, and share results publicly. Use case studies and results in marketing materials. Oxile does that very cleverly with email-gated case studies. It's two clicks in your website builder. Do it. Number three, build and leverage credibility. It feels like I keep banging on that same nail, right? But Oxile builds credibility through transparency and robust data sharing, reassuring customers of their technology's effectiveness. We do a lot of trust building in the market and really establishing credibility with the customers right now, which is, I think, the fun part of the process. Let me pick an example with their groundwater remediation story. I would spontaneously not believe it to be a possible and economic option, but the facts are here, they simply did it, and that becomes undeniable. So in concrete steps, do it yourself, publish transparent results, regularly publish detailed case studies and performance data. My additional touch here, talk about your failures. Silver bullets don't exist. You instantly win bonus points for me when you tell me where and when to not use you. Then engage third-party validation, obtain validations from end users, universities, labs, your pick, and finally maintain open communication. Be transparent about your technology's performance. Number four, position your technology as future-proofing for your customers. Oxile designs its technologies not only to comply with existing regulations, but with the flexibility to meet more stringent future standards, which we know will inevitably come. So regulation is not coming and saying you can't destroy, you have to just remove. Regulation is saying meet the regulations that are more stricter and stricter, which is also a pitch to our customers who are absorbing, let's say, for example, and they can't absorb the medium and short chain. We have to look at what the regulations are actually saying. They're saying, let's say, remove 100 PPT of 12 different people PFAS compounds or 50 PPT in the Benelux region, which is even more stricter for 12 different PFAS compounds. And if you're doing absorption or filtration, you can't meet those criteria with complex industrial wastewater matrix, for example. It absolutely does not scale. It is not cost effective and they can't meet the regulations. Then the conversation is more interesting. Here are your actionable steps. Stay informed on regulations, continuously monitor and anticipate regulatory changes. If you need a hand, listen to this podcast. Then develop adaptable solutions, design your technology with flexibility for future tighter regulations and educate your market. Inform clients about the future-proof nature of your technology and by the way, also share them your regulation monitoring, they'll thank you. Number five, prove your overall sustainability in concrete terms. Oxal focuses on complete pollutant destruction to address sustainability and minimize secondary waste, differentiating their approach in the market. The kicker for us is not just that we do broad spectra PFAS removal, we do that in one of our most cost-effective and scalable manner as well, which is why customers come to us. Because first you prove to them it works, and then we show them the kicker of the technology, how scalable it is, how easy to modularize it is, and how low on the capex it is and opex it is for them. The energy cost is where we are really proud to show the data and prove it. Beyond the PFAS example, you can do it as well. Highlight environmental benefits, make the sustainability of your technology a key selling point, then quantify your benefits, compare it to the incumbent technology, the famous three to six times better we discussed with Fadger, and document long-term benefits. Provide data on reduced environmental and financial costs. Number six, build as much as possible on existing infrastructure. Oxide's technology integrates seamlessly with existing water treatment infrastructures, reducing the need for additional capital investments, which we know may be a bottleneck in water endeavors. There is a huge pool we can harness from the existing water infrastructure. Bubbling vibrations, the flow of the water. We design our reactors in such a manner that you can really use the flow of the water as an active energy source. So first, assess the existing, understand how your technology can integrate with existing systems, then focus on easy integration, and finally promote the synergies. Communicate on the facilitated implementation thanks to mutual benefits of the old and the new. And number seven, customer assurance. Oxile employs advanced data collection and analytics to ensure customers are confident in the performance and safety of the treated water. We do a lot of data collection here to make sure our customers have this trust that the water that we're discharging is absolutely safe to discharge because we do full mineralization, like nothing is left. In actionable steps, you can implement comprehensive monitoring tools, develop or integrate sturdy simple sensors that you enhance with analytic tools, 
make it simple, provide customers with straightforward dashboards for real-time data viewing, and use data for continuous improvement. Regularly analyze collected data to improve the system. And there you have it, my 7 insights from Fajr Mushtaq in under 7 minutes. If you disagree with my selection, come tell me. And if you'd like to dive deeper, well, listen to the full interview. Remember, that episode came to you free of charge, but I would believe not free of value. It takes me quite some time to put all of those together every week, so all I'm asking is for you to help me distribute them. So take this episode and share it with a friend, a colleague, your boss or your team, and I'll be back with another one next week. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.